of scripture, which has already been read, comes to us from Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And while I've already read it, allow me to lift that 14th verse for emphasis. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And beloved, for the next few minutes, the topic of our teaching shall be, it is what it is. It is what it is. Several weeks ago, a member of the Bethel family approached me and said, well, Pastor, when are you going to get rid of those Alabama license plates and get some Michigan tags? And I wanted to say, when you pay for the Michigan insurance, amen. <laughs> because that has been a shock to my system, amen. But one of the reasons I've kind of put that off is because when I moved from New Jersey to Alabama, I had quite an interesting experience. I had put it off as long as I could between trading my tags in from New Jersey tags to get Alabama tags. However, when that time came, it was also around the time in which the then governor had put a mandate on photo ID laws that in the state of Alabama, in order to vote, you had to have a photo ID. Not only that, it was a way in which he thought he could quote unquote weed out the immigrants or the undocumented individuals in the state of Alabama. Well, around that same time that my tag was about to expire, the law came into place, and you could not register online. You had to go in person. And so that morning, I woke up extra early, got the boys off to school, and then I went down to the courthouse. And before the courthouse even opened, the line stretched all the way around the building. I stood in line for at least four hours just in order to get done the business that I needed to handle as far as my driving and my car tag. And in fact, I was there so long, I had a little attitude. Now, I know I'm a pastor, I'm saved, and I'm sanctified, I love the Lord, but after four hours of standing in line, and I was just thinking to myself, there has to be a more effective and efficient way to do this. And I'm just wondering, why, why don't they have appointments? Why don't they have multiple areas in which you could get your tags? And what made matters even worse is that the lady who was standing right in front of me, she just happened to have one of those really jolly personalities that's always positive and optimistic. Now, she's being positive and optimistic, and I have an attitude, so you know this is not going to work real well. And she was one of those persons who would talk to anybody. And since I was standing right next to her, she decided to talk to me. So as we're standing in line, I've got my attitude. She's like, well, good morning. <laughs> so good to see you today. And all of the small talk, and I'm really not feeling it. And after a couple of hours, she just goes on and on and on and on. And I just... <sighs> She said, well, are you all right? I said, no, ma'am, I'm not all right, because I don't understand why we have to wait in this line for three hours. She said, you're not from here, are you? <laughs> I said, no, nah, I'm from Jersey, and we, we do things a little bit differently. She says, well, what brings you here to Alabama? At that point, I had to tell her that I had come to Pastor St. John Church downtown Birmingham, and I felt kind of embarrassed because <laughs> I had this attitude. And then when I tell her, she says, oh, well, Reverend, the Bible does say patience is a true virtue. <laughs> At that point in time, I just decided to take a breath. I knew it was going to be a long time, that I was no longer in New Jersey. I was now in Alabama, and it is what it is. Because while I was huffing and puffing, it was not making the line move any faster or the people behind the desk <laughs> work any faster. And I just had to resolve and relinquish myself that this is the process that I have to go through in order to get my tags. And my brothers and my sisters, all of us have been to that point in that place at some time in our lives where we just resolve that this is the situation, that this is what it is, that we can't fight it, that we can't work against it, that it just makes sense for us to just be resolved in the fact that it is what it is. But when it comes to gathering all of those receipts and 
invoices come tax time that we might be upset and we might be frustrated, but guess what? The IRS is not going away. <laughs> it is what it is. When it comes not simply to paying income tax, but property tax, particularly here in the beautiful city of Ann Arbor, amen, that it's higher than any other place just about in the state. But fighting it and fussing doesn't make a difference. Why? Because it is what it is. When it comes time to do those things that we need to do that we don't feel like doing, some of us have just gotten to a point in place that it is what it is. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to stress. You don't have to strain. Just go with the flow. However, my brothers and sisters, I believe that as a people of faith and as a body of Christ, that while there are times where it is what it is, sometimes it's not what God wants it to be. That there are times when we have to stand up, that we have to stand out, that we have to speak up, that we have to speak out. Because just because it is what it is doesn't mean that that's the way God wants it to be. If you look at our current political climate, you could easily say that, well, it doesn't matter whether I vote or not. Yes, it does matter whether you vote or not. In the most recent presidential election, while millions of people voted, that it really depended on just three states. In fact, just three cities, if you were going to be more specific, in which the voter turnout went one way rather than the other. And there were those that stayed home. And because they stayed home, praise be to God, we've got number four. And just because that's what it is, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what God wants it to be. Now, I'm not attacking our commander in chief, not in this sermon anyway, but um, <laughs> sometimes we, we, we've got to be more active. We have to be more engaged in the world. And just because everyone is going along to get along doesn't mean that that's what we have to do. No, that's not what we were supposed to do. In fact, God calls us to be countercultural. That there are times when God calls us to go against the grain, that God go calls us to go against the flow. Because if it is what it is, but it's not what God wants it to be, then God desires for us to stand up and to speak up. I mean, that's who we are as a people. When it comes to who we are as African Methodists, the denomination that was founded over 200 years ago in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, it was a brother by the name of Richard Allen and another brother by the name of Absalom Jones who came to church one morning and their fellow white worshiper said, no, nah, y'all got to have to sit in the balcony today. They said, no, 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 not under my watch. That might be the way it is, but if it's not what God wants it to be, then we're going to leave this place and we're going to worship under our own vine and fig tree. Just talk to that sister by the name of Rosa Parks or even her predecessor, Claudette Colvin, who both sat down on that bus in Montgomery that day and said, well, it might be what it is, but that's not what God wants it to be. And I'm not moving. You can do what you want to do, but I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I'm going to stay right here. I mean, that's who we are. And that's what we're able to accomplish. In fact, we are here today because we had some four parents, some mothers, some fathers who said it might be the way it is, but if it's not what God wants it to be, then I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to stand out. I'm going to speak up, and I'm going to speak out. And God be praised for our four parents who said it might be it is what it is, but it's not what God wants it to be. But we learn that not simply from who our ancestors are culturally, but we also know who our ancestors are as a people of faith. The Bible tells us of a man, a brother, a young man who was a leader and a liberator for the children of Israel. But before he got to that point in place in his life, he was able to speak up and he was able to speak out. In fact, he was resistant about speaking up and speaking out until he had an encounter an extraordinary encounter with a super ordinary God. That leader and that liberator is a person by the name of Moses. You know about Moses, don't you? Well, if you don't know, just let me give you a few quick snapshots of Moses and how he grew up in the context in which he was reared. The Bible says that there arose a Pharaoh in Egypt that did not know Joseph. And that Pharaoh came about during a time in which the children of Israel who had come to Egypt, they were multiplying. In fact, they were like baby's kids. They did not die. They multiplied. And the the, con the issue that they had and the concern was that if you have so many Israelites in Egypt, 
then they may take over. So they came together with a plan. They said, you know what, we're going to enslave them. And when enslavement didn't work, they said, we're going to work them harder. And when working harder did not work, they decided, well, let's, let's do something. Let's, let's come against them. Let, let's figure out a way in which we're going to make certain that they don't succeed. So they put laws in place. They, they did things to them. I can imagine that they sat around the table and they said, you know what, well, we're going to ramp up our public safety issues against these Israelites. And every Israelite boy you see walking around with a hoodie, then that's the person you use for target practice. I don't know what the conversation was. Maybe the conversation was, you know what, let's make re-entry so hard that when they leave prison, if they get to prison, that they won't be able to vote, they won't be able to get a job, they won't be able to apply for a loan to go back to school. I in fact, we'll make it so difficult that they'll want to go back into this mass industrial complex system. I, I don't know exactly the conversations that they had. Maybe they said, well, in those areas and in those communities, we will let the lead seep into the drinking water that they will have so many issues that they don't even realize, and we'll just simply turn our backs. I don't know the conversation or the context they had. Maybe they simply came together and said, well, you know what? We will ostracize them, and we will target them, and in fact, we'll make sure that nothing about their community succeeds. But guess what? That, that didn't happen. They still kept having more children. It's been probably in one round table discussion one of Pharaoh's prime ministers said, well, let's just kill them. And so the edict went forth that all the boys, not the girls, but all the boys, that they were to be killed as soon as they were born. And the word says that they give instructions to the midwives, Shifra and Pua, and tell them that if it's a male child, kill him, snuff him out, smother him, whatever you have to do, make sure he does not see the light of day. But the word says that Shifra and Pua feared God. And because they feared God, that the Lord blessed them indeed. And one of these families had a boy by the name of Moses. And when Moses was born, his mother held him as long as she could. But as he started to grow and mature, she said, no, nah, he cannot stay here. Let me, let me put him in a basket and put that basket on the Nile. And I can see Moses' mother wrapping up her baby and kissing him on the forehead with tears in her eyes because she would rather her child have a future out there in the unknown sea than there in her own community. But you see, the word says that Moses had an older sister, and older sister did not let the basket just go out anywhere without being unknown, but rather Moses' sister watched out over the basket even as it made its way down the Nile. And that's good news for some of us. It helps us to know that God's got angels watching over us. I'm not sure about you, but I know that God's got an angel watching over me that all day and all night, God's angels are watching over me. And the word says that Pharaoh's daughter was bathing in the river and she sees the basket and she finds out that it's a baby and the same Miriam, his older sister who saw the basket go was the one who stepped up and said, you know what? I will make sure that this child is nursed and when he is old enough, I will bring him back to you. So Moses, who is a Hebrew, ends up growing up in the palace of the Pharaoh. And while his life was spared, I believe that Moses developed some identity complex. You see, he was too much of a Hebrew to be a true Egyptian and too much of an Egyptian to be a Hebrew. That he probably had this dual reality. He probably was living in one world pretending to be something he wasn't until that point in time that there was something that snapped in him and he ended up killing his own. And the word says that he was so afraid of the fact that he had killed, not his own, but the fact that he had killed an Egyptian. He was so afraid that he left. He ran away. So here he is, this, this refugee with this identity crisis. And not only that, the brother's got a speech impediment. That when he tries to, to, to talk, he stutters and stammers. So you got a brother who's a refugee, a bounty on his head, with a speech impediment. So he's got a lot of things, quote unquote, wrong with him. But even as he tries to have a new life, under a different identity. God knew who he was. God knew where he was. And God knew exactly what he needed to do. And so one day when Moses was on the backside of the mountain, 
taking care not of his sheep, but being the shepherd to his father-in-law sheep, Jethro, God spoke to him. And God says, Moses, there are some things that are going wrong. But you see, Moses was so enamored in the way in which God spoke to him because the word says that there was a bush that was on fire, but it was not consumed. And so Moses could not get over that. He was just trying to figure out what was going on and how this was going on because when he heard the voice called his name, he, he was scared and he was awed and he was amazed. But how many of us know that God can speak to you in different ways? That yes, God can speak to you from the pulpit on a Sunday morning, but I'm so glad that God does not simply wait until Sunday morning to speak to my spirit. That there are times in which I am tossing and turning, and it's nothing but the voice of God that I hear. Whether it is a song that my grandparents used to sing about trouble not lasting always, that God can speak to us in some different ways. Is there anybody here that knows that God can speak to you in different ways? That God can speak to you late in the midnight hour? God can speak to you early in the dawn, and God can speak to you in the midst of midday? That when God speaks, we ought to be willing and able to say, here I am, Lord. So the word says that Moses was seeing this awesome and amazing sight with this bush that's being burned and the bush is talking. And he says, yeah, yeah, this is me. And the Lord says, remove the sandals from your feet. Come no closer because the place on which you stand is holy ground. Now there's something about that holy ground is and we don't talk about holiness enough, amen. But I believe that we are called to be holy, that, that God has called us out of the darkness and into the light, that we are called to be holy. We're not called to be self-sanctimonious, but we are called to be holy. And holy doesn't mean that you are better than anybody. Holy just simply means that you have been set apart. You know like that furniture in your mama's living room that used to have the plastic over it? And she didn't want to let anybody sit there. And it wasn't that that furniture was any different than any other furniture, but that was simply set apart. And in fact, I grew up with a grandmother who had a sense of holiness. In fact, she was a stewardess at our home church, and she was one of the ladies that used to iron all of the elements that were on the sanctuary, and, and she had a sense of what holiness was. And I remember this because I spent a lot of weekends with my grandmother, and I remember how on Saturday nights she used to iron our clothes for Sunday morning. And I used to think to myself, Mama, why are you doing that? Because you can just do that tomorrow. She says, no, baby, tomorrow's Sunday, and Sunday's special. Does anybody else remember those days where you got ready for Sunday on Saturday night? Not only that, my grandmother would start making Sunday dinner on Saturday night. I mean, it was on Saturday nights that she would wash the collard greens and she would clean the chicken and she would bake the sweet potato pies. And I would be so hungry and wanting to eat. She says, no, baby, this is for tomorrow. And you see, because this is for Sunday and Sunday is special. And early on Sunday morning, she would get dressed with her hat and her pearls and her gloves and she would make sure that my shoes were shined and I was all together. Why? Because it was Sunday and Sunday was special. And it seemed like on those Sundays that my grandmother cooked the best dinner, the preacher took the longest time to preach on Sunday morning. And I'd be so ready to get home to get some of that good food. And as soon as we got home, I'd be ready to eat. She says, no, baby, take off those Sunday clothes because those are for Sunday and Sunday is special. And not only that, my brothers and sisters, when she would set the table, she just would not go into the kitchen, but she would go into the dining room and open up the china cabinet and she would take out her good stuff. And I'd say, Grandma, why are you doing that? She said, baby, because this is Sunday and Sunday is special. And my brother and my sisters, that's who we are, that we aren't everyday people, that we are not ordinary, but God has called us to be special. It doesn't mean we're better than anybody else, but we have been called out, set apart, that God might use us for his glory. I want someone to ask you why you act the way you do, because I'm special, and God has set us apart. God has called us to be the head and not the tail. God has called us to be the leader and not the follower. And I think some of the challenges we have in our community is because we've forgotten that we're special. Special, you are. 
blessed and highly favored. You are the lender, not the borrower. You are the apple of God's eye. You are loved by God in ways you can't even imagine. You are special. And my brothers and my sisters, when Moses is called into this special relationship, he starts to make excuses. He starts to, uh, y- y- you see, what had happened was, God says, I know you, I know your issues, I know your stuff, but I've spared you not to simply hide out away here, but to go back, to go back and to liberate my people. And Moses gets scared, y'all. He says, no, 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 God, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to speak. He says, don't worry, I got that covered, your brother. Your brother is going to be with you. Well, I I, I don't know how how am I going to let them know that's you who sent me. He said, that staff that you carry in your hand, it's going to be anointing in a particular way, and you'll have that with you. And then he has the nerve to ask God, well, who who will I say sent me? God says, really? (laughs) Well, the Bible doesn't say God said that, but in my imagination, I'm thinking God said that. And he says, do you know who you're talking to? I'm the one who formed the world in my hands. I am the one who was before there was a was and who shall be when is and are are no more. I am the one that spat out the seven seas. I am the one that talked the darkness and made light. I am the one that set the stars in the heavens and created the constellations. I I am the one that built up the mountains and scooped out the valleys, and you've got the nerve to ask who I am. In fact, I'm not going to tell you everything about myself because your mind isn't large enough to contain all the information that I could possibly give you. And when the question is asked who I am, just say, I am sent you. And I am sending you because just because this situation is, is not what I want it to be. And so Bethel, I've just stopped by to tell us just because it is what it is does not mean that it's always what God wants it to be. And in the same way that God gave Moses power to stand up, to stand out, to speak up, and to speak out, God is giving that same power in 2017 that you might not have to deal with the issues of ancient Egypt, but all of us have got some stuff in our life. All of us have got some issues. All of us have got some concerns. All of us have got some issues this is of life but if it's not what God wants it to be then what it is that it is it ain't gonna work because it's not what God wants it to be God has called each and every one of us to be the ones whom God uses in order to make a change in this world I believe that once we become the men and women that God wants us to be we then unconsciously liberate others to walk into their freedom as well so my brothers and my sisters Whatever your situation is right now, if it's not what God wants it to be, it means that you got work to do. And all of us can do that work. All of us can do it, regardless of our age or stage in life. In fact, I know all of us could do it because I met an extraordinary woman almost 20 years ago, and her name was Sister Fanny Crawford. And Sister Fanny Crawford was a member of the church. When I first started ministry, all the ministers had to go out and visit those who could not make it to church. And because of age and affirmity, Mrs. Crawford could not make it. But she always enjoyed the pastors coming to visit her. And I remember when I would visit Mrs. Crawford in the nursing home, while everybody else shared a room in the nursing facility, she had her own room. And I said, well, Mrs. Crawford, you're doing all right up in here, aren't you? And she said, well, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I said, well, how did you rank to get a room all by yourself? And she told me this long story. She said that when she first got to the nursing home where she was, that she had a room by herself. But then they moved somebody else in her room. And she wasn't happy. She was not happy. <laughs> she was used to having her own space, her own privacy, her own room. In fact, she said even when she was married, she still had her own room. (laughs) And, And she said that as soon as she had the roommate, she didn't have issues with the person, but she wanted her own space. 
And so she began to ask the nurses, could she have her own space? They said, no, policy and procedure. And the Medicaid policy says that we have to share rooms. She's like, mm, that ain't going to work for me. And so then she wrote to the manager of the nursing home. And she wrote this long letter and long hand with beautiful penmanship. She, she herself was a retired English teacher. And she kept asking why she could not have her own room. And they said, no, that's against policy. No, we can't do that. She says, well, who do I need to speak to to get my own room? And so she wrote letter after letter and letter after letter. She wrote the owner of the agency. She even wrote the chairman of the board of the nursing home. And then one day they had a board meeting right there on the property. And she knew that the chairman was downstairs. And so she wrote a letter and asked for it to be carried to him. And the letter read, have you received my letters about getting my own room? And so the attendant took the letter downstairs to the chairman and told the chairman that Mrs. Crawford had a request. Now, he had received the letters but just had not responded. And at this point in time, he was a little hot under the collar, and he was not very happy. And he said, tell Fanny that she cannot have her own room. The answer is no. If she does not understand the word no, then she needs to look it up in the dictionary. And if she still does not understand, I will come to that room to explain it to her. The message was brought back to Miss Crawford, and the attendant was really nervous. She said, what did he say? And then reiterated everything that the chairman had said. Well, Mrs. Fanny Crawford said, oh, really now? <laughs> Guess what? She wrote another note. Dear Mr. Chairman, I taught English for over 50 years. I have a master's in language. I know what the word no means. My question is why? If you don't understand why, you need to look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> if you still don't understand why, I will come over and to explain it to you. Well, brothers and sisters, the next week, Miss Fanny Crawford had her own room. Why? Because she was willing to say that she wasn't going to settle for it. It is what it is. And we know that not simply from those stories, but we have a brother by the name of Jesus. Not only is he our brother, but he is our Lord and our Savior. And the word of God says he was not a person who was willing to settle for it. It is what it is. In fact, all of his life, he said, if it's not what God wants to be, it's not going to work. He looked at other individuals who are having issues in their life and they said well it is what it is I've been on this pool by this pool of Bethesda for 30 years and Jesus said not anymore take up your bed and walk he looked at the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 long years, and she says it was what it was, but as soon as I touched the hem of his garment, I was made home. Come on here, tell me your story, Peter. Peter was a cussing, knife covering fisherman, and God said, if that might be what you do now, but come and follow me, and I shall make you fishers of men. It might be what it is, but if it's not what God wants it to be, then church, it just won't work. And even though it is what it is, we serve I am who I am. It doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy nor perfect. But what it does mean is that if this ain't working out right now, thanks be to God that we've got a power, that we've got access to the one that can change us, transform us, and help us to transcend any situation. If you're here today, we invite you to stand as you're able. I'm not sure what you're dealing with with but the same Jesus that was able to do it in the past is able to do it right now the Jesus who is able to look hell death and the grave in the face and said it might be what it is but it's not what God wants it to be if you're here today and you've never invited that Jesus to come in to be the Lord of your life to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Because the good news is you don't have to do it by yourself. God never designed for you to do it by yourself. 
whatever your is, is. Whatever challenge you have to face when you go home. There is help. No, there is salvation to do what you can't do for yourself. If you're here today and you've never said yes to the Lord, if you've not allowed him to come in, to change your situation from what it is for what God wants it to be, then this is your opportunity. This is your chance. Won't you come? Give me your hand and give God your heart. If that's you today, the doors of this church swing open and we invite you to come. Not simply to this altar, but to a Christ that can do what you can't do for yourself. Is there one today? And my brother and my sister, you may be here today. And maybe you need a new church home. Or a church home while you're in this area. Well, I would love to be your pastor. I would love to be your pastor. And we would love to be your church family. Isn't that right, Bethel? And so if you are here today and you need to come, either for affiliate membership, for watch care, whatever your need is, won't you come? Is there one today? Is there no one? What may come and finally, you may be saved and you may have a new church home or a church home where you're actively growing. But maybe the challenges of life have just weighed you down a little bit. If that's you today, if the is is of life have kind of weighed you down, and before you leave here, you want to have the confidence to know that it might be what it is, but if it's not what God wants it to be, I'm not going to settle. So if that's you today, whatever your need, whatever your desire, won't you come? Is there one? I know that I can stand. No matter. No matter what may come my way. I can take it with him I know I can stand no matter no matter what may come my way my life is in your hands Father God it's only in the name of Jesus that we dare come into your presence and God we want to thank you we want to thank you for everyone who finds himself here at the altar this morning. God, we don't know their situation or circumstance, and we don't need to know because you know God, and you're the one who's able to make a difference in their lives. So God, right now we lift up each and every person who is here at this altar. Some of them have brought diagnoses, God, that they can't handle by themselves. Some of them, oh God, have physical challenges that they can't handle by themselves. Some of them have got some family issues. There are some marriages that are dealing with some difficulty right now in the name of Jesus. But God, we know that you're able. So God, right now, we pray that you would touch each and every person here at this altar. And God, some of them come on behalf of someone else. They come on behalf of daughters and sons, grandchildren. And the situation in their life is not what it ought to be. So God, we pray right now in the strong name of Jesus that you would meet each and every need and that you would give them exactly what they need in the name of Jesus. For those, oh God, who need change and transformation, whether it be from attitudes, from addictions, whatever it is, God, we know that you have the power to deliver them right now in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for power that's greater than anything we know. We pray, oh God, that you might move us from where we are to where you would have us to be. So God, we ask, even now in the name of Jesus, that for those here at this altar and even for those sitting in the pews, that you would give them the courage and the confidence to stand up, 
to speak up and to speak out because we have the power from on high. So God, we say thank you. God, we say thank you. And whatever it is you choose to do, and however you choose to do it, we will be quick and careful to say that Jesus did it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. And the people of God said together, amen. If you believe that God has given all of us the power of change and transformation, won't you put your hands together and say amen? Amen. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hand. Watch me. You are the source of my strength.